Good afternoon, everyone. This is All Things Chess with Cybertel. I am Cybertel. We're continuing an examination of how to fight against the isolated pawn. We're looking at common defensive techniques against kingside attacks that come from an isolated queen pawn. Um, the game we're looking at today is Ella Kushner against Nona Kaprindashvili, two very notable women's players from history. Uh, Nona Kaprindashvili was probably the best overall women's player since Vera Menchik. Uh, she did have some uh, scattered successes in pure men's tournaments. She could play the best grandmasters in the world and come up on the victorious end uh, sometimes. Uh, Ala Kushner was sort of her close second. They played, I think, three matches for the women's world title. Uh, never beat her, but she was always in the fight for the title, at least. Uh, this is one of, from one of their women's world title matches. Uh, Kushner was white. Uh, D4. And we have a normal opening to get an isolated pawn here. Just standard queen's gam gamut accepted stuff. A6 is the modern main line. Um, and white has sort of a couple of different, or three really main moves he can play in modern chess. Uh, in the game, we see A4. Uh, this is an invention of Akiba Rubenstein's, uh, sort of the, one of the fathers of modern chess. Uh, sort of a committal move. It stops B5, but it creates a huge hole on B4 as compensation for it. Um, not to everyone's taste. I would say the uh, modern move is bishop b3. That In modern chess, that scores the best. The subtlety is it steps away from b5. So on b5, you don't have to move the bishop. You can play immediately a4 and try to take advantage of the b5 pawn. Um, I would say, objectively, this is probably balanced, but this scores the best for whites. Um, so it, it's doing something right. Bishop b3 is the most popular modern move. And then dxc5 is the hyper-technical path. Uh, this is basically if white is confident in his or her endgame skills, um, and he or she wants to see if they can uh, draw water from a stone. Because it's completely symmetrical pawn structure, white's just going to try to take advantage of uh, his or her very small leading developments. Um, but a4, I would say, overall leads to the greatest fight, keeps the greatest number of pieces on the board. So knight c6... Queen e2, aiming, his rook to go, uh, aiming the rook to go to d1, d1, and then ex d4. So now we get the isolated queen pawn structure. Knight d5. It's important for uh, Gaprindashvili to occupy the d5 square. Because uh, in this position, white is threatening to break through with d5, and it is a big deal. So in this position, black's first goal is to make sure that d5 cannot be achieved. That's sort of... When you're playing against the Isolated Pawn, that's your first level concern, whether the breakthrough with d5 is possible. Once you've controlled that, then you can move on to other concerns. So knight d5 physically stops the breakthrough with d5. Uh, bishop d3, probably not the best move. Queen e4 is the modern main line. This featured in a famous Petrosian Spassky game. Um, I think it was Ayakin Memorial 71, something like that. That's a game that we're going to look at later in the series. Uh, but queen e4 is probably the best here. Bishop d3 isn't the most accurate, because it is a bit vulnerable to a knight b4 later. Um, but it's, it's a perfectly normal IQP move, so it's well within the normal move margin. cb4, occupying the outpost, seeing the uh, bishop. That's good chess. Bishop d7, probably not the best move. With the move a4 included, you probably want to play b6 here. Uh, a5 is a threat in some positions, sort of a positional threat to bind the oh, black king, the queen side. Um, so bishop d7, it's perfectly fine, but it's probably not the most accurate. But both sides are still playing logically so far. Uh, queen e4, also logical. Probably knight e5 is a bit more accurate. Um, this puts the knight where we know it belongs, and it leaves the queen a bit more an aggressive position at the end of the variation. Yeah, six. And then in this variation, the queen ends up on h3, which is a bit more stable of an outpost than ends up in the game continuations. Because in the game continuation, the queen ends up on h4, where it can be vulnerable to tempo hits. So I think that is a little bit of a gain for white. h3 is a better outpost than h4, but that's a small detail. So queen h4, knight f6, queen h4, rook c8, continuing to mobilize. I've had a few quibbles about the moves, but I think most both sides have played fairly logically. Uh, bishop g5, continuing to mobilize. Perfectly good move. g6. Um, white was sim uh, simply threatened to take an f6 and made an h7. Black has two ways of facing this. 
uh, but really only one way. G6 is forced, H6 loses instantly, the bishop takes H6. Knight G5. Um, and white has two pieces for the pawn, but the material doesn't matter, because white's simply going to lift her rook into the game, and it's going to be over. This knight on F6 can't, can never move because of queen H7 mates, uh, but without the knight moving, you can't kick that queen away. So white can just hold black in place and lift the rook into the battle, and it's over. So this is a crushing position for white. So H6 is impossible. G6 is forced to block out the mate threat on A7. Knight E5. Not the most accurate. Uh, we've seen over and over in this series that uh, this formation with the knight on d5 and the knight on f6, this is often inaccurate because the, the knights sort of devour each other's activity. They sort of nullify one another. Um, most accurate here would be, be bishop c6. So this improves black's worst piece. So his worst piece was on d7. Now it's got some decent scope. Uh, the knight on b4 is actually doing useful work. It stops rook d3 which is a valuable attacking resource for white. So the knight on b4 actually accomplishes something nice. Um, one possible continuation, the knight g7, and this is actually a fairly common uh, attacking maneuver. The knight temporarily fianchettos itself, but eventually after rook e8, that knight's going to be heading to f5, which we saw from the... Uh, earlier today, I'm uploading an Urva uh, knight orf game, where the knight re-maneuvers itself to f5, and that frequents very fit, frequently in black's thinking. Uh, the knight very often wants to maneuver itself to f5 in these isolate queen pawn positions. That's both a defensive technique and a counterattacking technique. And here, it would fit the bill nicely for both those uh, taglines. So, the you have to play rookie 8 first, but then the knight is going to go to f5, and black will have a pretty decent position. Uh, but knight bd5, we've seen over and over again that these knights on d5 and f6 are just passive. They look nice, but they sort of step on each other's toes. Uh, rook d3, it's not the best, but again, it's thematic. I mean, this is a perfectly good move. I think knight xd5 is the best. I looked at the following line. And then queen h6, and this is actually quite dangerous. The, uh, the difference here is that knight, knight f5 is still achievable, but then you can just take it right off and then play rook d3. And white has the very concrete threat of just playing rook h3 in mates. And black doesn't really have a good response at all. Um, outside of that, that queen is a very dangerous piece in h6. It's sort of gobbling off all of black's uh, kingside squares. Um, this is a very danger a dangerous position for black. So I think knight xd5 is a little bit better. Rook d3 is perfectly thematic, though. Uh, knight h5, this is not the best defense. One common defensive technique, h5 here. So it's dangerous because it's sort of expanding your defensive trenches. And as I said in a few other videos, you can never take a pawn move back. So you need to carefully consider each pawn move that you make. But here, the fact that it's blocking out a rook h3 resource, controlling the g4 square, and blocking out h6, the uh, white queen, it is a valuable pawn move to make. Uh, and black's just in time to defend everything. So let's say rook g3, bishop e8, and black is just in time to defend everything. This is just just barely working. Um, white can't really win any material here. After bishop h6, knight g4, and the white queen's in trouble here. Uh, I'm just going to take the bishop off the board. But this is just barely working, whereas uh, after knight h5 g4, and this is very, very dangerous for black suddenly, because after g4, it's kicking that blockading knight away, and then white just has very simple threats of playing rook h3 on other moves, so knight f4 is forced, but then after rook f3, there's not a good support for this knight, so black just has to sort of keep, uh, keep herself hanging. Right there, g5, this is a huge error. Simplest move would just be queen h6, and suddenly... These knights, again, it's sort of similar to the d5 and knights on d5 and f6. They sort of step on each other's toes. They look nice, but they're very vulnerable. Um, white's certainly better here. The main line that I looked at was uh, queen b6. And this is still a complex position. Uh, this is even material, but here I would certainly take the uh, two minor pieces over the rook and the pawn. Um, Still complex, this is a fight, but uh, white's definitely for choice here. Um, whereas uh, the game choice, g5 just gives all those squares away, and suddenly that allows Gaprindishvili to defend everything. 
So 9h5, f6 is probably the best move here, but that's a quibble. 9h5 is so uh, natural here, just re-clogging the h-file. Knight e4, so this, this is common when you're attacking and you sort of meet resistance. It's hard to get your bearings again. Um, when you're attacking and you sort of break up against the first wave and you've misplayed something, you sort of have to take a deep breath and recombobulate yourself and accept the fact you're not going to be checkmating your opponents. Um, white needs to go ahead and take on d5. Take on d7. Push back 5. And... Black is nominally worse. Um, white's, white's king side attack isn't going to break through because you always have queen g6 to stop the mate in a7 after rook h3. Um, black's pawn structure is quite poor, but since you're not checkmating, the rook in f3 doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, but this would be best for white. But this would be white admitting that the king side attack just isn't going to work. Whereas after knight e4. That allows rook c1 check, and this is humongous counterplay for, for black. This is winning counterplay. Bishop x a4, so it grabs a pawn, but it's also threatening stuff like bishop c2 winning the rook on a1. So this is uh, collapsing for white suddenly. Um, knight c5, this is definitely collapsing. Uh, best would be knight g3. I've got another note uh, in the PGN file to look at, but just h g. Uh, but let's say rook xg3, bishop c2. And this is a common uh, defensive technique here, h5. Um, remember this defensive technique against an attack on the h-file. Uh, this is why in so many of these positions, white wants to keep her, uh, her queen on h6 to prevent this move. Because after h5, there's no great way to open up the h-file to continue the attack. Uh, and if white can't open up the h-file, the attack is more or less over. Um, but this this was White's best choice. Uh, whereas after knight c5, bishop d1, so now suddenly the, a black bishop is involved in the defense on the king side. King g7, just it, just giving back the exchange to get one of those knights off the board. Um, black is only up a pawn, um, but including to be an up a pawn. Uh, white's king is far more exposed than black's king, uh, and white's pieces are all tied up due to that rook on c1. So this is completely winning for black. And it's, it's nice to see how good Prindish really converts. Rook g1, f5 is best. Uh, it is the white king that's the more exposed of the two now, so you want to open up lines against it. Knight d3, queen d6. Uh, queen d2 is more aggressive and more accurate. Um, black is fully justified for playing for me here. But queen d6... F6 was also more accurate here. Just a quick line. Um, and that exposes uh, the way for queen f4 check in black screening. E3. And this part of the game, I'll, I'll just leave that for the PGN notes. Um, I'll just give a few moves to sort of demonstrate what I'm talking about. Now I'll just go through the rest of the moves since we're here. Um, and Kushner resigned here. Uh, this is just completely winning. But from the from this point, um, Black's up a pawn. Both the knights are far better placed than either of White's minor pieces. Um, and that bishop on b1 is still victim to a mortal pin. Um, so this was a somewhat in, in uneven game. I wanted to show it because it's a game that I've never really seen in the literature before. And it's actually fairly decently illustrative of uh, IQP attacking chances on the ki uh, king side. Because... Not everything goes right for black at first. There's a few inaccuracies, and that allows white to develop a pretty nice attack on the king side. And that forces black to show some typical defensive techniques against that attack. Yeah, so here, g6 is standard. In so many of these positions, g6 is just the only move. h6 against the isolated queen pawn, you rarely see unless there's a very specific reason. Like, for instance, here, it just gets destroyed by an immediate sacrifice, which very often happens in the isolated queen pawn. Um, but yeah, g6 is a standard defensive technique. Bishop c6 was the better move here. We've seen in so many cases that the knights being on d5 and f6 is just bad for black. Uh, rook d3, the rook lift. We, again, we see in these sorts of positions, whenever you can get off the dark square bishop and then bring a queen to h6, that is very, very strong uh, for white. Uh, this is a very nice position for white suddenly. But even, even after rook, the rook lift, 
Uh, 9 h5 wasn't the best move. And then g4 was extreme, extremely dangerous. And this took Gapinish really to the brink. Um, basically, white played very, very well until g5. And then g5 gave all of Kushner's advantage away because it gave away um, that h5 square for the knights. And suddenly, once that knight has that outpost square uh, again, that blocks everything off for white. And white's kingside attack is suddenly quite over. So. Um, interesting game. It's very, like I said, very uneven, but I want to show it because I think it's more illustrative of a real isolate queen pawn fight instead of a sort of an idealized endgame slog against the isolate queen pawn. Because uh, the isolate queen pawn certainly got some punches in here. Uh, Gaprin Shalili just sort of survived and reversed against Kushner. Um, so, very interesting game. We're going to continue uh, tomorrow with continued examination of how to blunt an isolate king side, isolate pawn king side attack. Um, but until then, my name is John. I'll see you later.